360 is where we gotta be. We're at 387 CO2 parts per million now. We need more renewable energy. We gotta get more right now. Well, welcome to Post Carbon Radio, where we explore the ways in which we can and must power down in a new era that is no longer exploiting our fellow humans and ecosystems. We believe in building up our community. Resilience, expecting further economic collapse in the face of abrupt climate change, the end of cheap oil, the depletion of our natural resources, and a possible mass extinction on our planet. I'm Bing Gong, and Bernie is taking uh, a break today, and I'm in the studio today with uh, James Heddle of Bellinas, and he is, works uh, one of the founders of the Ecological Options Network. Uh, so welcome, Jim, to Post Carbon Radio. Thanks, Bing. Glad to be here. Uh, tell us just a little bit more about uh, the work you're doing. Well, uh, E.ON, the Ecological Options Network, is um, is a media production and reporting organization as well as a community organizing and catalyzing organization. Um, right at the moment, we're at work on a documentary called Shutdown, the California-Fukushima Connection. People can find out more about that by going to our uh, documentary's website, which is shutdowndoc.tv. And uh, we also have uh, a number of reports on our uh, ongoing YouTube channel, which people can find at youtube.com slash eon3. Well, we have a full program extensively on the nuclear news updates. And uh, Jim is here. He's been focusing on covering uh, all aspects uh, of things nuclear. So I think we'll start off with uh, saying just information is empowerment, and we need to know about these things in order to engage and do something about them. So, Jim, you want to take it from here? Well, yes, uh, I'm re- reminded by what you just said is that there's an old, old expression that we have to seize the bull by the horns. But a great American philosopher and humorist, W.C. Fields, uh, changed that around slightly, and it's a, it's a aphorism I like to quote. He said, there comes a time in human affairs when we must seize the bull by the tail and stare the situation squarely in the face. So it's in the context of providing people with empowering information that we're uh, bringing this news to you, some of which is encouraging and some of which isn't. Um, So I think we'll begin today with uh, an update on what's going on in Japan uh, with our uh, roving Eon uh, Japan correspondent, Umi Hagatani. She's there covering events uh, for us and shooting uh, documentary footage that will eventually be included in our documentary. I just want to give a brief background uh, for this. Um, There's a pressure now in in Japan by the Abe administration to restart all the 48 uh, nuclear reactors that were shut down after Fukushima, even though they... Many of them are not up to uh, snuff on on safety dimensions. So concerned citizens are fighting that restart uh, impulse. And there was recently uh, a heartening court decision. Uh, One of the the reactors uh, was restart was turned down by a judge. And we, we look at that as a precedent that we hope will be followed. There's also a, the issue of remilitarization in Japan. The Abe administration uh, is pushing to remilitarize Japan and even uh, potentially to be, uh, have Japan become a nuclear weapon state. Uh, this is backed by, of course, the nuclear industry, but also by Washington, which uh, uh, is encouraging Japan to... Uh, arm itself and be more participative in what are called uh, defense operations. The Abe administration recently made a decision to reinterpret the pacifist Japan uh, constitution that's been in power since the the 40s to allow 
what they call self-defense forces to be deployed around the world, mainly in support of uh, U.S. Uh, military possible uh, uh, military policy. Also, um, the attempt to remove radioactive soil uh, from the contaminated areas is proving to be hopeless, and uh, is it, the radioactive soil is being scraped off and contained in plastic bags, which are strewn across the countryside. Uh, there's nowhere to put them, nothing to do with them. There's also the increasing hyperthyroidism of children uh, who have been contaminated by radioactive fallout from Fukushima. That's up almost 40%, according to some reports. And then there's a leak in fuel pool 5 and possibly in fuel pool 6 for the two reactors at uh, Fukushima Daiichi that weren't affected directly by the tsunami and earthquake. Is this in the spent fuel uh, yeah, section? There are, two, there are two spent fuel mm-hmm, pools, mm-hmm. and particularly Unit uh, 5 is worrisome, and they are reporting that they only be, they only have a few more days to contain the leak before there's a possibility of it going critical. To further complicate the situation, there was just a, a, a large earthquake not, lo- not far off the Japanese coast, which caused a tsunami warning to be issued, although the reports are so far that there was no damage uh, noted uh, by TEPCO at Fukushima. The other, the final thing I want to mention is the implied deterrent represented by Japan's large accumulation of uh, weapons-grade plutonium, both in country and abroad, which would make it possible for the Abe administration, with these new controls loosened, to uh, begin creating nuclear weapons. And uh, even if they don't create the nuclear weapons, the storage of such weapons-grade plutonium represents what's called an implied deterrent. That is, it's a a message to surrounding countries that we could do it if we want to. So it's in that context that uh, our uh, Umi Hagatani um, is reporting. Uh, she, She starts by mentioning a recent news conference held by the Fukushima Women Against Nuclear Power, or Uh, women of Fukushima demand end to nuclear power. It was uh, a press conference held at the press club in Tokyo, and they sent a message to the world, which is, quote, we would like you to be aware of this serious reality in Japan and to pay attention to it. We need your help in our activities toward toward minimum damage of nuclear power disaster. So here's our EN correspondent, Umi, Hagatani, in in a recording I made last Friday. I went to an action by women of Fukushima. Their real name is the Women of Fukushima Demand and to Nuclear Power. And they have held a die-in action followed by a press conference. About 200 people participated in this uh, die-in action in front of the Ministry of Environment. And uh, their majority members are the plaintiffs uh, who are suing TEPCO and uh, also the government responsibility because they're the survivors of the nuclear power accident. And also some of them are supporters of those children, including uh, junior high schoolers and elementary school students who are asking the city of Koryama to evacuate them because of the exposure to the radiation. But the women of Fukushima, their statement demanded the reduction of the radioactive exposure is uh, more urgent than the current federal policies and practices in Japan, which is to force people to remain in the contaminated area. For example, for kids particularly, this is harsh. There are so much outside events happened carried out since 2011. Many students of the fifth grade and sixth grades in the elementary school, they attend something called the cancer seminar where they learn about the, how cancer is such a typical story for many people so they don't have to be worried about and it's going to be always taken care of when you get the cancer. They're trying to even build um, a junior high school and high school combined together by 2020 in Hutaba County, that is the closest place ever 
that to the Fukushima Daiichi. But the administration of the town invited and they made a survey to the kids. And uh, I guess kids were not told about the options that they can evacuate. So they ma- it, it made it look like uh, that they're interested in coming back. And so it seems like that right now the Abe cabinet has um, already schemed out a lot of um, brainwashing and making people feel that it's in, it's possible to decontaminate and it's making the suffering of the people um, invisible. So they're trying to normalize the idea that everybody gets cancer and it's no big problem. Right. I feel like that this is, after three years, there are more cover-ups and silencing the survivors on this ongoing nuclear accident in Fukushima Daiichi and it is really well supported by the structural power hierarchy within the cabinet or even outside the cabinet. So um, it's very scary to see this. The current situation is that the Ministry of Environment is putting fake monitor radioactive monitoring posts all over and without the consensus of the people who are living in the areas, no-go zones and outside of no-go zones and they're not giving any options and compensations to the people, first of all, whether they want to evacuate or not. And they said, okay, this is the day to decontaminate, so, you know, please be, be convinced. And they, they're, they're failing, constantly failing to decontaminate because they can only uh, kind of scrape off the, the topsoil scraped off radioactive topsoil from the decontaminated area as a whole will be more than 100 million trucks worth of um, you know, amount. So they don't know where to take care of them. So they're even, these days in the city parts of Kodiyama or Fukushima City, uh, relatively bigger cities in the Fukushima prefectures, I've seen pictures of uh, the piled up uh, contaminated soils because they do not know how to take care of. But still, by scraping off these soils, the prefecture government, also the federal government, says that, okay, the problematic area is once decontaminated, but the women of Fukushima is making that this decontamination doesn't follow the will of the people who are living there unless the government give exact measurement uh, and also give um, options to evacuate. And so uh, I understand that the government is also trying to get people to move back into the contaminated areas uh, and giving them some slight stipend to do so. Is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, this is called ADR. This is called Alternative dispute resolution. So for the people who evacuated from the no-go zones, they must get um, some kind of, you know, some amount of money. But these people who successfully got the money, received the money, only received the half the amount that they were promised. And when these people made a claim that this is not, this is not properly uh, managed, then the center and a representative of the center said that um, if this is going to be a problem, you can sue. But suing in Japan is not very casual, and it's we're not familiar with that. So this is really ridiculous. It's like a slap on our face. Yesterday, there was a protest at the Consulate General of Israel in Tokyo, and many anti-nukes folks have uh, attended the rally against the bombing of Gaza by the state of Israel. And this is such a crucial issue, and people seem to be very worried about this because uh, Japan has just decided to, uh, Japan's cabinet uh, approved that we have collective self-defensive rights so we can send our troops from Japanese self-defense um, to uh, participate in a lying in power, including the U.S. or, you know, including any country if Japan wants to. So a lot of people are alerted that the, see the bombing in Gaza 
could necessarily be the place that where our troops could be sent. And also, um, the nuclear facilities is attacked, you know, uh, in this rampage. I mean, people are afraid that if uh, Japanese gets involved in uh, hostilities elsewhere in the world, that Japanese nuclear facilities will be attacked? Um, yes, no. people are very afraid that the nuclear facilities, all nuclear facilities can be targeted in case of war. You know, so in Israel, there is a um, there's a nuclear facility, right? Yes, Dimona. Oh, okay. On July 9th, the Hamas had announced that they have uh, sent shot three rockets to Dimona, and uh, one of them has uh, actually crashed onto the something called Iron Dorm, and uh, no. Nobody was hurt by this, but this is very, very close and to the reactor. And this has a lot to do with the Israelis' um, pro-nukes approach, pro-nuclear weapon approach. So uh, Japanese people know about this and feel very alerted. And now, because now we have means to create nuclear weapons and have... Uh, legal procedures that allows us to build them. So you're afraid that if uh, Japan builds nuclear weapons, they will become a target for nuclear attacks? If Japan makes the nuclear weapons, of course they will be attacked. And also having nuclear reactors is already an attack to us because it could be targeted already as a storage space for nuclear weapons. Around the world, nuclear facilities are sitting duck targets for potential terrorists. So they're they're kind of terrorist weapons in place everywhere they are. Right, right. People in Japan are already terrorized by just having nuclear nuclear power plants. So they do not want to risk anything further. So it was a very very uh, important uh, rally, and um, we hope that. Uh, we can share this fear with the people of other worlds who might be against the nuclear power because they're knowing the nuclear accident happening in Japan, but who may not be connecting that with nuclear weapon facilities. Well, I really want to thank you for doing this with us, Umi, and I, I hope you'll stay well and stay safe, and thank you very much for your work. Thank you so much. That was an interview with the Ecological Options Network Japanese correspondent Umi Hagatani with Jim Heddle. And we're going to continue with our nuclear uh, news update with Jim Heddle. I think you're going to discuss San Onofre next. Yes. Um, our friend and colleague uh, Donna Gilmore down in San Onofre, she's the founder of uh, and webmaster for sananofresafety.org. It's a site I highly recommend. Uh, I'm just going to uh, draw from the site to uh, update you on the issue of high burn up fuel. It turns out that according to Donna's uh, extensive research that San Onofre and other U.S. nuclear reactors switched some time ago, maybe over a decade ago, to what's called high burn up nuclear fuel. The high burn-up fuel is over twice as radioactive, hotter than lower burn-up fuel, and unpredictable and unstable in storage and transport situations. The majority of uh, spent fuel at San Onofre falls into the danger zone for dry cast storage. And there is no approved method uh, to safely store high burn-up fuel in dry cast for more than 20 years and there is no approved method to safely transport high burn-up fuel waste. This fuel is so hot that it has to be kept in spent fuel pools years longer than lower burn-up fuel. And, of course, your listeners will know that uh, fuel pools, uh, even if the nuclear reactor is shut down, depend on outs outside off-site uh, power to keep running. So any disruption in the... Uh, electrical supply from off-site could lead to a meltdown in the fuel pools. 
So um, the the standard uh, the Southern California uh, Edison has gone ahead and to the alarm of surrounding residents, they've canceled emergency plans before the NRC has approved it. Southern California Edison, uh, according to the local residents, eight million of them, in fact is irresponsibly endangering the lives of 8 million residents just to save a few bucks, changing the emergency response protocol from full liability to decommission status without the NRC review or approval. Revision 34 of that review, uh, that report, uh, eliminated multiple emergency response organization positions in the emergency uh, operations facility, the technical support center, the operations center, and the joint uh, information center uh, that was formerly maintained by Southern California uh, Edison. That means that uh, in the event of a, an emergency, there is no longer uh, safety backup. So I think we have time to, to get into the Diablo Canyon report. Okay. Um, This is uh, information from our friends uh, Linda Seeley and others uh, who are the organizers uh, of uh, Mothers for Peace, uh, uh, an organization that has been uh, active for many years in uh, the region surrounding uh, the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor, which is operated by PG&E. Just recently, the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board gave notice on June 23rd of this year that PG&E's that PG&E's application for license renewal will not be ready to go forward until March of 2016. The previous expectation was that it would be ready for uh, April 2015. So that's good news. The relicensing application would extend the license and operating of this dangerous nuclear plant uh, run by a dangerous <laughs> a dangerous corporation with a bad safety record uh, into the essentially indefinite future. So um, there is also um, an evidentiary hearing as has been requ- be been requested by an ongoing pending lawsuit um, that is a legal challenge to um, the idea of PG and E um, analysis of potential difficulties at uh, at the plant. It. Uh, it charges that the PG&E uh, position fails to take into consideration the sh- new information about the shoreline fault, uh, which is one of 13 uh, active earthquake faults underlying the Diablo Canyon location. Um, so uh, two developments related to the handling of spent fuel at Diablo, which has the same high burn-up fuel problem I was describing at San Onofre. It's a million more times radioactive than it was when it was first put into the reactor. The um, Mothers for Peace case for the expedited, they were recommending and the expedited transfer of spent fuel from pools uh, to dry casks. It was denied uh, by the NRC um, except for the chairman, Allison McFarlane, who voted that further study should be done. Um, The NRC had also, uh, late one night before a public meeting, declared that uh, uh, a formerly unapproved cask for storage and transport, uh, dry cask storage and transport, had been approved. And in April of 2014, uh, the uh, attorney for um, Mothers for Peace, Diane Curran, worked with the attorney um, Mindy Goldstein of the Emory Law School and to object on behalf of 20 organizations around the country. And as a result of that objection, the NRC has delayed a final decision on approving CASC for storage and transport of fuel at Diablo. That's good news. Well, I see uh, we're going to talk about the California, what CCR bill? Well, uh, community choice aggregation, 
is an attempt by local communities to take charge of their energy policy. Like and we've done in Marin with Marin, right. Clean Marin Energy, Clean Energy. Uh, with such a battle against PG&E, and now the corporations are trying to prohibit communities from forming CCA. They're trying to kill the CCA Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. concept, just like they did with Prop 16. They keep coming back like zombies against democratic choice. They're trying to do an end run on this. I'll report a little more about that after the break. Well, I think we can continue. We've got about uh, four minutes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So AB 2145 uh, is making its way through the California uh, um, representational system. Uh, it's a, according to its uh, um, opponents, it's a CA, CCA killer bill. Community choice aggregation is, or CCA stands for local control of energy uh, generation. And it is still alive, and all reports say it's amended for uh, hearing in State Senate Appropriations Committee on August 4th, probably at 10 a.m. in room 4205 there in the Capitol if people want to attend. The bill retains elements of very damaging, uh, that are very damaging to CCAs and the whole idea of community choice energy. Its only purpose is to cripple uh, that concept as much as possible on behalf of the utilities. It has no redeeming benefit or value, and uh, the marine clean energy itself remains opposed to this bill. So the aim of um, uh, opponents of this bill is to end it in the Senate Appropriations Committee if possible, and uh, opponents are saying that we should be telling all members and staff of the Appropriations Committee in person and by mail, by email, by phone, by social media or website postings that uh, the public populace is opposed to it. Uh, key people to contact are Senator Kevin DeLeon uh, in Sacramento and also uh, Senator Jerry Hill. Um, and people can contact them at the Capitol, uh, easy to find their, their uh, addresses. Then uh, for people that want more information, the official position paper of California's for Energy Choice, the voice of the broad coalition of cities, counties, and districts, trade unions, civic groups, and environmental organizations that turned out 80 witnesses against AB 2145 at the Senate Energy Committee June 23rd hearing, where the deadly opt-in feature was withdrawn. That was an idea that uh, in order to have this go into effect, uh, individual customers would have to opt-in, which would essentially kill the bill. The paper uh, outlines the remaining dangers of the CCA bill, and the paper uh, should be shared widely. You can find it at www.no2145.org. And that's a good site to go for for the updates. Okay, I think we'll take a little station break. Uh, you're listening to KWMR, Community Radio for West Marin, Point Ray Station, and Bolinas. Uh, 90.5 FM in Point Ray Station and 89.9 FM in Bolinas. And now a 92.3 in the San Gerardo Valley and streaming live at kwmr.org. KWMR is supported by the Point Reyes Hostel, a nonprofit organization providing low cost accommodation to individuals and groups of all ages within the boundaries of the Point Reyes National Seashore. The Point Reyes Hostel is a Bay Area certified green business committed to promoting environmentally responsible travel. More information online at pointreyeshostel.org. The 2014 Far West Festival provides an opportunity for artisans, chefs, and craft vendors to share their wares with the fest-going public. This year's event happens on Saturday, July 26th, and will feature live music, and local food at Love Field in Point Ray Station. Vending and festival information available at farwestfest.org. And now back to Post Carbon Radio with Bing Gong. And today our uh, co-host in the studio is uh, James Heddle of the Ecological Options Network. And 
We are giving a nuclear news update today. Do you want to continue, Jim, with, uh, let's see, Hanford, I believe, is next. Fukushima on the Columbia. Now, many of our listeners may not know, but that there is a Fukushima-style nuclear power plant operating on the banks of the Columbia River. Uh, it's called the Columbia Generating Station. If uh, you've never heard of the GCS, well, it's not surprising. It was originally known uh, as the Washington Public Power Supply System Nuclear Plant Number 2. You may remember WPPSS by its less flattering name, Whoops. It's a notorious for causing the largest bond default in the history of municipal finance. And whoops, it became synonymous with reckless management of nuclear facilities. So consequently, whoops changed its name to Energy Northwest and renamed the power plant, omitting the term nuclear from the name. So now it's called G- CGS, and it's located on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation near Richland, Washington, 220 miles upstream from ports from Portland. The plant generates only about 4% of the Northwest electrical power, but it poses considerable risk to residents of both Washington and Oregon who share the Columbia River. It was designed by General Electric, the Mark II reactor, uh, a similar design to Fukushima. And uh, although the GE engineers and top management knew that this reactor design was flawed as early as 1972, the company continued selling reactors to uh, both the United States companies and abroad uh, throughout the United States. So uh, this is located, as I say, on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, which was the origin of the uh, nuclear bombs that rained down on Japan. And uh, uh, it, it itself, uh, even if there wasn't a nuclear uh, generating station operating there is one of the most dangerous and potential lethal uh, nuclear storage sites in the world uh, with with all kinds of safety problems, tanks leaking uh, into the groundwater and potentially into the Columbia. The other dangerous thing about the, uh, the, the Columbia generating station is that it's located downstream from a number of dams on the Columbia River, uh, some of them earthen dams that w- would be subject to damage by earthquakes and so on. And uh, it's also in a wildfire zone, I believe. But in the, in the event of uh, these dams bursting uh, and flooding the region, that would present a, a real danger to the whole region uh, around the plant. So local residents are pushing to have it shut down and they need support from around the country and the world. The next topic I'd like to just briefly cover is uh, an update on the the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, uh, down in New Mexico near Carlsbad. Your viewers, uh, your um, listeners probably know that... um, a couple of months ago, there was both a fire and then a few weeks later, uh, a major release from the Whoops plant. Uh, and it's um, it was uh, still ongoing. They have yet to find out uh, what caused the uh, explosion and emission of radiation around the area. Uh, there are no certainty as to the cause. This was supposed to be um, a, the state-of-the-art uh, apotheosis of waste storage uh, sites and, and was going to be the model for all those allegedly to come, was supposed to be safe and isolated from the environment for 10,000 years. It's operated for 15, and it's already had repeated problems and releases. There was just a recent uh, uh, monitoring of a a more recent release from the initial release, um, and it uh, was up uh, way, way above safety standards. So the fact that this is an ongoing disaster in our own backyard 
and poses a really serious uh, problem for what to do with the storage of nuclear waste, how to isolate it from the environment. Um, the um, canisters that were shipped there uh, are only part of the existing canisters that have the same potential explosive capacity. And uh, those are sitting now, uh, some of them are sitting now in Texas uh, in a, a above ground. Now that's what I was going to mention, and they are not really qualified to deal with this type of waste, as I understand, in the open. That's right. That's a whole mm-hmm. story that I think we should go into in depth at some point, the the whole Texas connection, uh, which uh, has uh, private entrepreneurs trying to do end runs around public safety and make Texas uh, the last repository site for waste from all over the country. A very dangerous idea, both for transportation and local storage problems. So um, along those lines, uh, another alarming development, the EPA has made a proposal to raise uh, nuclear radiation so-called safety standards by 350 times. Which means they're going to allow us to experience more radiation. 350 <laughs> times more than they probably, uh, than they formally said is safe for public health. And they cite that it's good for profits and health. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good for business and it's going to be, um, it will save people, um, mental anguish from having uh, what's called radiophobia, the irrational idea that radiation may not be good for you. When, in fact, uh, the Beer 7 report, which is a, a prestigious and authoritative report, <clears throat> um, has definitively stated that there is no safe threshold of exposure to nuclear radiation that damages the DNA, organ tissue, bone, and everything at, at um, at whatever dosage level, there is no linear response uh, collaborate, or, uh, correlation between how much you are exposed to and how much damage gets done. And so um, it turns out that there was so much uh, response to this I- idiotic idea of raising the safety level by 350 times that the public comments uh, period has been extended now until August 3rd. And I'd like to uh, urge people to make their vi- their positions known on this idea. And where would they do that? They would go that to uh, www.epa.gov slash radiation slash laws slash 190. Let me run that, read that just once more. epa.gov slash radiation slash laws slash 190. And they can uh, weigh in on this. Uh, 190, because if you type in an O, I think. No. Oh, right, right, <laughs> 190. And uh, weigh in on this important issue. Um, this is all in the context, of course, of uh, a recent what's called a nuclear posture review, which brings up uh, amusing ideas of where they're putting their head. But... Um, the first strike doctrine, which has been part of the U.S. military uh, lexicon now for since the beginning, is still being continued, although the uh, Obama administration has said that they'd sure like to not have a first strike doctrine, but maybe they'll be able to do that sometime in the future, but they can't do it now. So they're pursuing what is called, ironically, a life extension program for the nuclear weapon arsenal of the United States. Life extension program for nuclear weapons, as much of an oxymoron (laughs) as that seems, is uh, an attempt and a plan uh, to upgrade all existing nuclear weapons arsenals uh, with new, smarter, better more effective weapons, if you can say more effective about such things. Then there's also a plan on the books to uh, produce a whole new fleet of nuclear-armed and powered submarines, uh, which will be deployed around the Earth. They'll be wonderful uh, because they can be they can hide for months at a time without moving or being detected. 
and that will mean uh, nuclear power projection by the United States to virtually every inch on the planet. Uh, this is uh, something that needs to be brought into public consciousness and opposed. It's, uh, as Umi um, in her report noticed, and that you Japanese uh, know, uh, and as we mentioned in that interview, nuclear reactors themselves, and even just nuclear waste storage facilities, are in fact nuclear weapons, potentially, for uh, a nuclear uh, conflict situation. And I'd just like to mention the case of Ukraine, where, as your uh, listeners know, there is an ongoing civil war which is being um, uh, perpetrated uh, with the support of both Russia and the United States, but mainly the United States. And uh, there are uh, 15 operating nuclear plants in the Ukraine, in addition to... uh, Chernobyl, which is on the north, north, just north of Kiev, which uh, people may know is in serious trouble. The sarcophagus that was originally put in place is decaying, and so uh, Fukushima, I mean, um, Chernobyl uh, releases of uh, radioactivity in the future are a real possibility. There has been a plan to uh, build a new sarcophagus over the old sarcophagus, but that is that project is way behind schedule because of the extreme difficulties of it. And also now it's unfunded because of the uh, financial situation in the Ukraine. So this is a this is a highly dangerous situation and it underlines the idea that nuclear weapon nuclear reactors anywhere they are are essential nuclear weapons in place for terrorists. Jim, I think we just have enough time to play uh, Harvey Wasserman. Do you want to introduce that clip? Okay. Well, Harvey Wasserman, as many of your listeners will know, is a longtime, lifelong uh, activist uh, and reporter, and uh, he's going to be in um, Point Reyes coming up uh, in a project, uh, in an appearance co-sponsored by the Cultural Potholes dot com and eon that's cultural potholes dot com and uh it's going to be sunday august 10th 2014 at 7 p.m in the private room at the station house cafe in point ray station it's an rsvp event and so you can find out more about cultural uh, about it at cultural potholes dot com harvey's also going to be appearing august 6th uh, in, at 7 p.m., that's Wednesday, uh, at the Fellowship Hall, uh, at 1924 Cedar Street at Bonita in Berkeley. That's sponsored by the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists. So, here's Harvey, uh, in a presentation that he made, uh, uh a month or two ago at uh, the commemoration, the, the fourth anniversary of uh, Fukushima event that was held in Laguna Beach, California. It's an honor to be with you guys, and I hope everybody understands how hugely significant the deactivation of the San Onofre reactors really is. It's a, a tremendous step forward in the history of the human race. And I don't overstate that when I say that. It's very, very hard to do to shut down uh, commercial reactors. Um, but we are now at 100 in this country. This is my 41st year working at this. Uh, in 1973, uh, a nuclear company came into a town in Massachusetts where I was living. We had an organic farm. And uh, we vowed to stop them from building it. And today you can go where they were going to build it. The, the bulldozers never came in. And you can lie down on the grass and look up at the sky and think this would have been two reactors. And now you can drive by San Onofre and see three shut power plants. We have a huge waste issue, but it is a huge deal. So as they say, mazel tov to all of you. Congratulations. It's a, it's a tremendous victory, and it means a tremendous amount. Now, uh, today, um, as mentioned, I do a lot of writing about Fukushima. Um, I, was, uh, I work at night, late at night, and uh, one of the reasons I work late at night is because I never get phone calls. And um, I go till about 3 in the morning usually, and at 2 in the morning, on March 11th, three years ago, I got a call. And the guy asked me, my friend David asked me to turn on CNN, and there it was. And, uh, you know, our lives have been 
um, not the same ever since. And I think well, most of us understand the gravity of the situation, but I want to say a, a couple of things. First of all, um, to all those out there who say that no one will be harmed by Fukushima, uh, um, it is the biggest lie ever told. Um, I went into central Pennsylvania. Uh, it was nice to see Eric up there um, in the, the year after the accident uh, at Three Mile Island, and I interviewed uh, dozens of people. It was the worst time I ever spent in my life. Uh, uh, cancer, leukemia, birth defects, stillbirths, malformations, uh, open sores, loss of hair, metallic taste in the mouth, animals that couldn't breed. <clears throat> it was like being in a, in a science fiction film, a very bad science fiction film. And yet the industry still persists in saying that no one was killed at Three Mile Island. It's a horrible lie. They say not enough radiation escaped from Three Mile Island to harm anybody. They don't know how much radiation escaped. They will never know how much radiation escaped. All the monitors went off scale during Three Mile Island. They, they had a, a thermoluminescent dosimeters which measure radiation where it goes, and there was one um, that went off scale exactly where it was expected in the northwest quadrant where the wind was blowing, and the industry said it was a defective monitor and it didn't mean anything. Uh, that's what the industry does. If you push a button and they have a major disaster, the instant response is always the same. Not enough radiation escaped to harm anybody. That's what they said about Chernobyl. That's what they're saying about Fukushima. And that's what they'll say about the next accident and the accident after that. We, and WIP as, and WIP as well, yes. And let me give you a little, a quick history here, um, starting with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the military said that when people started losing their hair and, and all the other horrible things that happened, the military said, well, there's no such thing as radiation. What are you talking about? And then they had to fess up that there, there was radiation in it, which the scientists knew, of course. The scientists who made the atomic bomb circulated a petition. 80% of the scientists in the Manhattan Project asked the military to drop the bombs in uninhabited areas so that they would demonstrate to the Japanese what we have but not kill all these people. But of course, the, Jap the, the military went ahead and did that. They bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, by the way, because those were two of the four cities we deliberately did not bomb so they could test the impact of the bombs from, with aerial photographs. To this day, the, 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 tests in, the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are referred to as announced nuclear tests. Right. And they denied that anybody would have any health effects at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Then they denied that there would be any health effects from the bombings in the South Pacific, the atomic tests that were conducted in the Marshall Islands, especially at Bikini. This is the 60th anniversary, March 1st, 1954, the Castle Bravo uh, test. They blew up Bikini. It was twice. It went off twice as powerful as they thought. The wind shifted direction, and a, an un unfortunate ship, the Lucky Dragon, was completely con uh, contaminated. Uh, six of the 23 crew, crew members eventually died of liver cancer. And the, the chief of the Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss, accused them of being communists and trying to make the Americans look bad. <laughs> because they went and died of liver cancer. What a, that's a communist plot. Uh, uh, Louis, Louis, Strauss is, Louis Strauss is the same guy that said nuclear power will be too cheap to meter. Then, and this is the killer, and this is the one thing you need to always remember when you're debating someone from the nuclear industry. In 1956, Dr. Alice Stewart, who was not looking for anything resembling radiation, found in a, in a survey she was doing that uh, a, a women who are x-rayed during pregnancy, their offspring will have a doubled childhood leukemia rate. Now this is the, this is the she was attacked, she was crucified, she was pilloried, she was blacklisted, you name it, for 30 years. Now, I, met, I met Dr. Stewart, she was in the, <laughs> didn't mess with Alice Stewart. She was an amazing woman, she stood her ground, and then after 30 years in the 1980s, the medical profession finally said, well, maybe we shouldn't really x-ray pregnant women anymore. And, and, uh, and, you know, they, and, and maybe when you go have a dental x-ray, you might want to put on a bib. And maybe x-ray technicians should leave the room when they do this day after day after day. The bottom line is there is no safe dose of radiation. There is no dose of radiation that can be shown that it will not harm an embryo or a fetus in utero. There's no such thing. There's no number. 
And this has been proven time and time again. So when you have these people running around saying, Fukushima is the equivalent of eating a banana. We've seen that in this, this ridiculous movie, Pandora's Promise. It's the equivalent of eating banana. It's like flying from New York to Los Angeles. It's like living in Denver. It's utter nonsense. Radiation kills people. Many, many, many people will die as a result of Fukushima. There is absolutely no doubt about it. We have a study that indicates these three Russian scientists surveyed 5,000 studies that were done about Chernobyl and came to the conclusion years ago, this is years ago, that 985,000 people would die from, from the Chernobyl disaster. And so now we're, we're in, and, and you know, I'm in this combat every day, all of you are, about the, the health effects of radiation. Uh, the health effects of radiation are unknown. They cannot be known. The science is, is imprecise. But there is more radiation coming out of Fukushima than we would ever, ever want to con contemplate uh, uh, introducing into our natural environment. 300 tons a day of highly radioactive water every day for in perpetuity are coming through the Fukushima site. What do we have at Fukushima? We have three melted cores that they don't know where they are. If I had described, or any of you had described to an audience of nuclear engineers what happened at Fukushima on March 10th, 2011, they would have thrown you out of the room, they would have laughed at you, they would have said you're not credible. If we had des described what happened at Chernobyl the day before, on April 25th, 1986, they would have laughed you out of the room. And I heard this from 1973 on, the nuclear industry repeatedly saying, like a mantra, a nuclear, co a commercial reactor cannot explode. A commercial reactor cannot explode. A commercial reactor cannot explode. And anyone who dared say that in public, that one could explode, they were deemed as not credible, discredited, you name it. Well, we, now we've had five of them that have exploded. Five commercial reactors have exploded on this planet. The one at Fukushima, I'm, I'm sorry, the one at Chernobyl, when, when Chernobyl exploded, they said, oh, that's not relevant, that's that old Soviet technology, that has nothing to do with the rest of the industry. Come on. And now, of course, now these, these four reactors that have blown up, three meltdowns, four hydrogen explosions, these are general electric reactors. These are American commercial atomic power plants. There are 31 Mark I and Mark II general electric reactors in the United States. The containment domes on these plants are paper mache, basically, and the geniuses that built these plants put the spent fuel pools up in the air outside the containment domes, 100 feet in the air. And let me tell you something else. I was in Japan in the mid-1970s. I marched with the anti-nuclear movement. We showed them movies, I, a lot of dialogue. I wrote an article for the Progressive Magazine that was published in 1977 that talked about Fukushima and said, the people of Japan cannot believe that the nuclear power industry would build commercial reactors in an earthquake tsunami zone, like the Apple Canyon, for example. But we don't talk about the American ones, right? Um, uh, and by the way, I did uh, three lovely nights in the county jail in San Luis Obispo in 1984. I highly recommend it. Food's not, <laughs> food's not very good. The, 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 the orange, orange um, uh, polyester, just not my color, but um, very nice people there. It's very comfortable, and you'll have a good time when we go back up there. But uh, nonetheless, they were warned. They were told repeatedly, do not build nuclear power plants in earthquake zones washed by tsunamis. And it's worse than that. There was, if you look at photographs of Fukushima before the site was built, before the reactors were built, it's hard for me to say this. There was an 85 foot high natural seawall at Fukushima. Units five and six are up in the air. That's why they didn't get, that's why they didn't explore. They weren't operating at the time. But they weren't, as, they could have possibly turned them back on. They, they weren't severely damaged. Had they been operating at the time, there would have been a lot of problems. But the f units one, two, three, and four, they took down the seawall. There was a mount, an 85 foot high hill there going down into the sea. Why? Well, they didn't want to have to pump the water all the way up, and they didn't want to have to unload the, uh, the, the components of the reactors and move them up the hill, so they removed the hill. And then they say, well, we couldn't have expected what happened there. Come on. Then, to top that off, they, built the, they put the backup generators, the backup power generators, in the basement. 
below sea level, for God's sakes. What, who is surprised? Not only did the tsunami wipe out the, the backup steam generators, but it made it, backup power generators, it made it impossible to ruin the connections. So when they came in with backup, backup, you know, brought them in by trucks, or my favorite, they went out in the uh, parking lot and, and um, uh, ransacked automobiles and trucks to take car batteries out to bring into the nuclear power plant. That's how desperate they were. Um, but they ruined the connections. So that when the, when the tsunami came in, in this below sea level basement, they couldn't plug anything in because it was all destroyed by the, by the tsunami. And they say they couldn't predict this. Totally predictable. Now there's a core problem here, and I'll, I won't go on much longer. The core problem is that these are private corporations. TEPCO, which per, the perpetrators of this global post-apocalyptic disaster, is a private corporation. There is one goal and one goal only in the corporate charter of TEPCO, and that is to make money. Now, we circulated a petition um, asking that the global community be take over at Fukushima so that all the world's scientific and financial resources would be available to deal with the Fukushima crisis. We got 150,000 signatures. We delivered them to the United Nations on November 7th. You know what we heard? Nothing. We've heard nothing, not from the Secretary General, not from TEPCO, not from the, from the Japanese government. But the fact of the matter is that TEPCO, like every utility company in the United States, has no financial liability for any of the damage that they do. It is not in the interest of PG&E or any other corporation that owns a nuclear power plant to protect the public safety because there's no money in it. God forbid Diablo Canyon, and by the way, Fukushima is not a worst case scenario. It is, by, it is way, way far, way short of a worst case scenario. A worst case scenario is that that, that, that 9.0 Richter scale earthquake that was 100 miles offshore was one mile offshore or right under Fukushima or right under Diablo Canyon or right under Indian Point, for God's sakes, 35 miles north of New York City. Then what you get is rubble a pile of radioactive rubble with multiple meltdowns, hydrogen explosions, possibly fission explosions. And by the way, we're not 100% sure that there wasn't a fission explosion in Unit 3 at Fukushima. It's quite possible. If you look at the cloud, it, might, it may have happened at Chernobyl too. So not only can reactors explode, but they may actually fission and have that problem as well. But nonetheless, TEPCO um, is not in any way, shape, or form incentivized to protect the public safety. No one from, from TEPCO has been prosecuted for this, uh, as no one was at Three Mile Island. Chernobyl may be a little different. But, um, uh, and in every case, by the way, not only was the public misinformed at Three Mile Island, at Chernobyl, and at TEPCO, uh, at uh, Fukushima, the governments were misinformed. The President of the United States was lied to by the operators of Three Mile Island. Gorbachev was lied to by the operators of Chernobyl, and certainly not Okan, was lied to by TEPCO repeatedly throughout this disaster. So the bottom line for these guys is this at TEPCO. The cleanup of Fukushima, such as it is, is a profit center. They are making money playing at cleaning up uh, the, 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 the site there. Some of the most powerful footage in this film was dealing with the workers there. They didn't really talk about organized crime. But Reuters ran two very powerful um, uh, articles uh, documenting that the, 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 wor the workforce at, at, uh, at Fukushima, as was at many of the commercial reactor sites in the United States when these plants were being built, is dominated by organized crime. When you get that many people working on a, on a tight site with tons of money around, you're going to have the mafia in there. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's a totally corrupt situation. There is no incentive to clean up Fukushima just like there was none, at, you know, they're not even done, I'm almost done. They're, they're, all, they're not even finished at Chernobyl. You know, we just had this, uh, whatever it was in Ukraine, they're not done putting the sarcophagus uh, over, over Chernobyl. Who's gonna finish that job? So the bottom line is this, uh, uh, TEPCO had an, an extremely profitable year last year. After all they did to the planet, TEPCO made over $8 billion last year in profits. So what we have to do is do what was done here at San Onofre and do it damn quick. We shut four reactors last year, four commercial reactors. We went down from 104 to 100. We're, um, uh, Exelon says they're gonna shoot, uh, shut five more. But we are all, this year, but we're all living in absolute terror 
from any one of these commercial reactors. And the good news is, and I'll finish with this, we are in the midst of a technological revolution, unprecedented in human history. Photovoltaic cells will be the biggest industry in the history of the world. Every building, every home, every office, every vehicle, every machine, every handheld device will have photovoltaic cells to convert sunlight to electricity, every one of them. Windmills, uh, so, um, uh, biofuels, uh, um, uh, ocean thermal, geothermal, all these technologies have exploded. Just watch any documentary uh, film with Amory Lovins in it and you'll understand what's happening here. What's standing in the way of our survival on this planet and of our prosperity as a species is nuclear power. You guys have shown that, uh, uh, you men and women have shown that uh, nuclear power plants, however big, and however well funded, with however big a utility behind them, can be shut down. And now we have to duplicate that all over the world. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. And let's have questions. That, um, that is Harvey Wasserman. He's going to be uh, in Point Reyes uh, on Sunday, August 10th at 7 p.m. at the private room at the Station House Cafe in Point Reyes Station. And that's an event co-sponsored by culturalpotholes.com and E.ON, and you can find out more and sign up to uh, for the RSVP at culturalpotholes.com. Harvey will also be speaking at the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists August 6th at 7 p.m. in Berkeley at the Fellowship Hall at 1924 Cedar Street at Bonita. And I just want to finish up by pointing out uh, something that several stories in this report have suggested, and that is the, uh, the inseparable connection between nuclear energy, so-called waste, and weapons nuclear weapons. In 1955, a study undertaken by the AEC concluded that the commercial nuclear reactors would not be economically feasible if they were used solely to produce electricity. They would be, however, if they also produced plutonium, which could be sold. So this dual purpose uh, 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 design for nuclear uh, power plants has been a part of the a scenario right from the beginning. In a document from the Los Alamos uh, Laboratory dated August 1981, one finds this statement. There is no technical demarcation between military and civilian reactors, and there never was one. What has persisted over the decades is just the misconception that such a link does not exist. That misconception is one that's been fostered by governments and utilities uh, right the way along. So nuclear energy waste weapons connection is a brain dead, means that it's a brain dead technology being kept alive by artificial life support without taxpayer dollar underwriting the, in the form, uh, underwriting the whole operation in the form of loan guarantees, subsidies, liabilities for accidents and cleanup. Nukes will die, uh, of what Amory Lovins has famously called an overdose of free market forces. Then we will only have to worry about the 250 million years of storage problems that we have facing us. But let's make it happen. So thanks, Bing, for having me on today, and uh, I encourage people to find out more at the websites we've delineated. Well, thank you, James Heddle, for joining us on Post Carbon Radio and uh, keeping us abreast of what's happening on things nuclear.